I'd like to read uh, from uh, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, my favorite epistle of Paul. Uh, and it begins with the word awake, because we are about awakening a discipleship. And this is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 14 and following. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise persons, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, always and for everything giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. The word of the Lord. And from the joy of the gospel, Evangelii Gaudium, by our dear uh, Pope Francis, and this is uh, about the key word next to Jesus in the new evangelization. If you were to ask me what is the key word next to the name, holy name of Jesus himself, can you summarize the new evangelization in one word? And that word, for me anyway, would be kerygma, K-E-R-Y-G-M-A, the proclamation of the saving love of Jesus Christ. And here's what the Holy Father says in paragraph 164. In Catechesis 2, we have rediscovered the fundamental role of the first announcement, or kerygma, which needs to be the center of all evangelizing activity and all efforts at church renewal. The kerygma is Trinitarian. The fire of the Spirit is given in the form of tongues, and leads us to believe in Jesus Christ, who by his death and resurrection reveals and communicates to us the Father's infinite mercy. On the lips of the catechist, the first proclamation must ring out over and over. Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you. And now he is living at your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. The first proclamation is called first, not because it exists at the beginning and can then be forgotten or replaced by other more important things. It is first in a qualitative sense because it is the principal proclamation, the one which we must hear again and again in different ways, the one which we must announce one way or another throughout the process of catechesis at every level and moment. For this reason, too, the priest, like every other member of the church, ought to grow in awareness that he himself is constantly in need of being evangelized. I should stop right there and get off the stage, because that says it all. Kerygma. It's one of the things I tried to focus on in my time at the bishop's conference uh, there in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, when I uh, uh, kind of facilitated evangelization, organized evangelization in the dioceses, in the church throughout the United States, to kind of get across the need, particularly in preaching and teaching, to focus on that love of Jesus Christ. We have given our hearts to Jesus. We just sang about that. But we must always remember that Jesus first gave his heart to us. It's the basic message of the devotion to the sacred heart, to divine mercy, to devotion in general. And that it comes, as the Holy Father says right there and in this marvelous document, through the Holy Spirit. We must never forget that the Holy Spirit, coming from that crucified heart of Jesus in the form of water, comes into our poor hearts 
refreshing us, strengthening us, and bringing our hearts together. A beautiful song by Bernstein and Sondheim from West Side Story, making of our hearts one heart becomes real in our devotion to the Holy Spirit, which brings Christ and us to a heart-to-heart, core-at-core, loquitur, heart-to-heart experience. Now, I have chosen among the many images of the Holy Spirit to choose from, I have chosen to use the image of music. Our Holy Father loved music himself, and we must never forget how central the Holy Spirit is in all of the writings and teachings and activities of Pope Francis. That's why he's so spontaneous. And I don't think that's been emphasized enough how spirit-filled Pope Francis is. As a matter of fact, it is the goal of this document, as he says in the very uh, concluding part, to form spirit-filled evangelizers. And shouldn't that be our goal as priests, deacons, and seminarians in our preaching and teaching, in our catechesis, in our ministry, to call people to that intimacy with Jesus Christ. When I was working in the bishop's conference on a document for evangelization leaders, I wanted to uh, put as a definition of evangelization, helping people to fall in love with Jesus. Guess what the reaction was? They thought that was too mushy, too romantic. And how far we have come If you check out the propositions of the Synod on the New Evangelization, if you check out the um, uh, talks by both both, uh, Pope Benedict and uh, Pope Francis, you will see how important that emotive love for Jesus Christ is to the New Evangelization. You bet your life it is a falling in love with Jesus Christ. And calling our people to it is what we are about. But let's be honest. Let's be honest. We have a long ways to go in the Catholic Church in our preaching and teaching of the kerygma. Am I exaggerating? A long ways to go. I would make evangelization far more central in our seminaries, in our formation of priests and deacons, especially so that we come across as preaching not only Jesus, but the Catholic Jesus. I like to say the pizza supreme Jesus, with all of the fillings, all of the ingredients. And don't you dare scrape off the anchovies. Everything you want to know about Jesus, we have as Catholic Christians, don't we? Then why do we hold back in our proclaiming of Jesus Christ and our calling people to that experience of Jesus Christ? And I choose the metaphor, the image of music, because it's something we could all relate to. Can we not? Where's our music group? They left. (laughs) We could all relate to it because it gets our juices going, and it is very scriptural. You heard St. Paul, Ephesians 5. Awake, you sleepers. Do not get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Spirit, making music with psalms, hymns, and inspired canticles. And the Jewish culture was and is very musical. Psalms, hymns, and inspired canticles are musical, are they not? Did you see Fiddler on the Roof, either the play or the movie? You see Tevye just dancing up and down the uh, czarist Russia, singing and praying as he sings. And even in our own time, I just mentioned Leonard Bernstein, great musician, George Gershwin, my favorite, Bob Dylan, Simon and Garfunkel, right? Great musicians, precisely because they have been with the Holy Spirit so long. Because it is the Spirit that moves us to make music with psalms, hymns, and inspired canticles. Now, I want to uh, read a passage from the Joy of the Gospel, because what I want to get across the uh, fact in terms of focusing on the centrality of Jesus in our hearts and calling people to an awareness 
That's what the awakening is in spirituality. The awakening experience is that uh, awareness of the presence of Jesus, that love of Jesus in our hearts. As St. Paul says, the love of God poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit in Romans 5, verse 5. How, how can we get that across to our people in our preaching and our teaching? And the first rule is to be aware of it ourselves. One of the reasons I love to preach is because as I preach to you, I'm listening to what I'm preaching. Is this making any sense? So preaching is for me a religious experience akin to Eucharistic adoration, the rosary, Marian devotion, an experience of being in love with God, precisely because I'm paying attention not so much to my words, but to the spirit working within me. And it is very much for me a song. When I was in the seminary in the 60s and early 70s, I belonged to a seminarian's folk group. And as Paulists, you know, we have a lot of campus ministries. I live in one right now, the University of Texas in Austin. And we would go from campus to campus, coffee house to coffee house. We were very 60s. And we would um, bring our guitars and our Roman collars. In fact, we called ourselves the Roman collars, R-O-A-M-I-N apostrophe. Pretty corny, huh? And we would take the songs of the day, particularly songs of the Beatles, uh, the Supremes, Simon and Garfunkel, Bob Dylan. Remember those days? Peter, Paul, and Mary. Remember those folky uh, songs? M most of which had great messages to them and good lyrics to back up the good melodies. And we would then tie those songs and those messages together in a gospel message. Eventually, one of our members, Ken Meltz, would be a liturgical composer himself. But it was a kind of a great experience of not only singing, but also eventually preparation for preaching. Because what I try to do in my own preaching is to have a form to it with cadences, with a movement so that people can move to what you're saying in a kind of a rhythm, even though you're not particularly singing the hymn, uh, excuse me, the, the sermon or the homily, but your cadences, your passion, your motion, your movement is somehow creating a form similar to a good song. That's a little bit abstract, but maybe as we go along, uh, you'll kind of get uh, the point I'm trying uh, to make. Now, when was the kerygma first proclaimed to me? It happened on my mother's lap when I was a toddler, unable to breathe at night because I had asthma big time. <gasps> That's how I used to wheeze through the night. Fortunately, I th had two wonderful parents who got up in the middle of the night to take care of me. Anthony Nielli, Sicilian Catholic from Brooklyn, Vivian Bowl, German, English, anti-Catholic from the Bronx. Somehow they got together and for five years went together and got married. And romance can cover a multitude of problems. Fortunately, they had a wonderful parish priest, Father John Byrne, who also baptized me who married them in Churiavars Parish, Merrick, Long Island. Uh, in those days, the Protestant had to make the promise to bring the children up Catholic. Anybody remember those days? And my parents had to get married in the rectory. They couldn't get married in the church itself. But they loved each other, and they both loved, in their different ways, Jesus. They both loved Jesus. My dad ushered at the same mass for 50 years, very loyal, and my mom, as an evangelical, kind of unchurched evangelical, but nevertheless evangelical, talked about Jesus all the time. Both of them went off to World War II. My dad in the Army Air Corps, my mom in the Marines, one of the early women Marines. 
We are a very patriotic family. My great-grandfather actually fought in the Army of the Ohio during the Civil War. Uh, living in Cincinnati, he was an abolitionist, which meant in all probability worked for the Underground Railroad, helping slaves from the South move to freedom in the North. So we are very American, very patriotic, our family. But they came back in 1946, the first year of the baby moon, had me. Thanks be to God, my mother had a great knack of nurturing and comforting. So did my dad, but different. My mom would hold me in her arms and sing to me an evangelical hymn that had been sung to her when she was a little girl. And being very much afraid, am I going to make it till the next day as a two, three, four, five, six-year-old, she would sing me the following song, which I hope I could sing to you. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, loves me still, though I'm very weak and ill. From his heavenly throne on high, he comes to watch me where I lie. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. You sang that very well. Why? Because it's singable for one reason, and it's so simple. Not only is the melody a simple melody, but the words are so fundamental. Yes, Jesus loves me. And I claim that as my first experience of the Holy Spirit. But the word Holy Spirit is not in there. In fact, the first time I ever heard about the Holy Spirit, it was the Holy Ghost. And so my image at the age of five or so was Casper the Friendly Ghost. Hardly a devotional icon. But the experience of the love of Jesus, get where I'm going with this? That's what the Holy Spirit does. He gives us that falling in love experience. Precisely because he brings the love of Jesus into our hearts. Amen? In a heart-to-heart Loquitur, colloquy, encounter with the living Jesus Christ. Now, here's why I want to quote from our good friend Pope Francis, because he says the same thing in terms of how a homily should be presented. And one of the very unique things about the joy of the gospel, it's one of the very few documents of this nature that speaks so much about the homily, several pages, so that you and I as preachers can be, in fact, more charismatic in our approach and calling people to that conversion to Jesus. Here's what the Holy Father says, a mother's conversation, paragraph 139. We said that the people of God, by the constant inner working of the Holy Spirit, is constantly evangelizing itself. What are the implications of this principle for preachers? It reminds us that the church is a mother and that she preaches in the same way that her mother speaks to her child, knowing that the child trusts that what she is teaching is for his or her benefit. For children know that they are loved. Moreover, a good mother can recognize everything that God is bringing about in her children. She listens to their concerns and learns from them. The spirit of love which reigns in a family guides both mother and child in their conversation. Therein they teach and learn, experience correction, and grow in appreciation of what is good. Something similar happens in a homily. The same spirit who inspired the gospels and who acts in the church also inspires the preacher to hear the faith of the people of God and to find the right way to preach at each Eucharist. Christian preaching thus finds in the heart of people and their culture 
a source of living water which helps the preacher to know what must be said and how to say it. Just as all of us like to be spoken to in our mother tongue, so too in the faith we like to be spoken to in our mother culture, our native language, and our heart is better disposed to listen. This language is a kind of music which inspires encouragement, strength, and enthusiasm. Now, I, not, I know it's not true in this particular congregation, but have you ever experienced a homily that is going no place or all over the place? Or, you know, the airplane sermon, you know, when's he going to land? Because sometimes we lack those cadences. The most famous speech of the 20th century, in all probability, the great speech by Martin Luther King, on the Washington Mall. It wasn't written down. He looked at the congregation there, 250,000 people, all religions, all walks of life, a little bit of Americana, and he wasn't connecting. So he chucked the written text and opened up his heart to the Holy Spirit and came those cadences. I have a dream that someday on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will sit down together at the table of brothers. I have a dream that someday swords will be turned into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. I have a dream. I have a dream. The cadence is built up. And so we remember the homily, do we not? Precisely because it, in fact, became a kind of hymn, a kind of song. And in fact, if you go to many African-American churches, Pentecostal, Baptist, whatever, you will notice that oftentimes the preacher will preach and the preaching will evolve into a song, which is in fact exactly how American popular music got started. Now, I like to look upon the Holy Trinity, we just had Trinity Sunday, in the following way. Here's one way to look at Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God the Father is the composer. He's the Leonard Bernstein. Okay? God the Son is, Jesus is the vocalist. He's the Frank Sinatra. He's the Bruno Mars. Dare I say the Lady Gaga? But God the Holy Spirit is the music, is the melody. I like to call the inner music of the soul. That's the Holy Spirit. God the Father, the composer. God the Son, Jesus Christ, the vocalist. But God the Holy Spirit, the melody, the inner music of the soul. And one of the things I lament about most contemporary popular music is a certain lack of melody. There aren't that many tunes you could teach your children and grandchildren. Am I exaggerating? They're just not there. And I think a lot of it is due to the exaggerated emphasis on performance. You know, with the advent of MTV and videos and so forth, performance became all important. But I think that trumped a good tune and a catchy melody. I'm open to criticism, but where are the Simon and Garfunkels and the Beatles and the uh, Bob Dylans, right? Where are they? Where are the Bernsteins, the George Gershwins? Where are they? Where are the Broadway shows of years past? It's hard to find catchy tunes because I think we have, in many ways, as the Holy Father says in this joy of the gospel, too much emphasized externals over internal reality and fundamentals. Now, Memphis, Tennessee. I spent 16 very happy years ministering in that very musical city. Now I am in another musical city, Austin. Anyone ever go to South by Southwest? But Memphis was a little different because Memphis had the tradition of the spiritual. Now this is important. This is a little bit of history, but I want to show, again, how the Holy Spirit is moving us to that love relationship with Christ in our heart because it happened on the cotton fields of the South. If you saw the movie 
12 Years a Slave. Anyone see the movie 12 Years a Slave? Very fine movie. Tough to watch. But you will notice, there on the cotton fields of the South, as the slaves were moving, of course, they didn't have drums, they didn't have electric guitars, they simply had their souls. And they had their passion, they had the rhythms of West Africa, but they also had the preaching of evangelists and even some of the hymns of people like Isaac Watts. So they put it all together, and you will see in the movie, as they're doing their plowing, doing their work on the field, a hymn evolving, because it helped to keep them going. And those hymns came to be called the spirituals, appropriately enough, because the Holy Spirit was behind it all. What are the spirituals? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let us break bread together on our knees. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Has anyone ever heard of those songs before? Raise your hands if you heard of any of them. We've all heard them because they're part of the earth. They're part of our culture. Which word culture comes from? Cultivating the earth. They're part of Americana. Are they not? Because they came from the Holy Spirit and thus are called the spiritual wolf. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Wade in the water. I could go on and on. Those songs are 200 years old because they came from the earth. And they came from a people of the earth. Now, their children along the Mississippi Delta from places like Clarksdale would come up north to the northern tip of the Mississippi Delta called Memphis. And there on Beale Street gave us the blues. The passion that the slaves took to God, go down Moses, this little light of mine, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, the passion that they took to God, their children and grandchildren took to neighbor, to people, to marriage to love, to work, to prison, to chains, train, very day-to-day -day experiences of the African-American people, and that's how the blues was born. There on Beale Street, two blocks from St. Patrick's Church, where I spent 16 very happy years, was B.B. King's, is B.B. King's origi original res uh, restaurant. In fact, I have a brochure. Here it is. Beale Street, best Creole Southern cooking. Well, I don't know about that. But certainly the birth of the blues. We also have, and I have it right here, Stax Records, Macklemore. The spirituals combined with the Pentecostal movement in the African-American church gave us soul music. Soul music was born not in Detroit, but born on Macklemore Street in Memphis, here it is, Stax Records. The Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, was born just a couple of blocks south of St. Patrick's Church. And here we have Sun Studios on Union. The spirituals hooking up with country music, giving us rock and roll. What am I saying? I'm saying the music that we are basically hearing tonight with the drums and the electric guitars and the acoustic guitars, and so forth, is basically based on the spiritual. Uh, am I making any sense? And you might say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Plenty. Music is what brings us together, correct? Music is what gets our juices going and moves us as a people. And especially if that melody has a lyric to back it up, we can praise God and say, yes, Jesus loves me. This little light of mine, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and the marvelous songs we are singing with the music group tonight. So there you have it. 
precisely because of the Holy Spirit, we have a music that unites America. I think even Congress, in the aftermath of 2001, September the 11th, got on the steps and sang the music of a Jewish cantor. You know what that music was? God bless America. Irving Berlin grew up in a synagogue. Amen? Now, what do we do? When we preach, when we teach, when we catechize, we try to open up our hearts to those inner voices, the voices of Christ within, Christ in me. I live now no longer I, but Christ lives within me, St. Paul says in Galatians 2, verse 20. And he lives in me through the inner music of the Holy Spirit, but he is the vocalist, right, the singer. But I like to suggest that he sings with four voices. And the voices that I would suggest he sings with come from philosophy. That's why we priests study philosophy before we study theology. I studied scholastic philosophy, basically the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. And we studied the transcendental, which Thomas, in fact, got from Aristotle and Plato and the Greeks. Anybody remember, brother priests, what are the four transcendental? Unity, truth, goodness, and beauty. Unity, truth, goodness, and beauty. Why are they called transcendental? Because they transcend the categories of Aristotle. I'm sure I took the words right out of your mouth. They are called transcendentals because those are what our hearts long for. My namesake, Bruce Springsteen, everybody's got a hungry heart. St. Augustine, everybody's got a restless heart. Restless for what? Hungry for what? My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, Psalm 63. Thirsting for what? thirsting for unity and truth and goodness and beauty. And these words permeate the writings of our recent popes, including Pope Francis, especially Pope John Paul II, a great philosopher in his own right. And also, as I would like to suggest and talk more about tomorrow, the conversion of servant of God Isaac Hecker, founder of the Paulists, to Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church. He came through a group of people called the Transcendentalists, a group of people who wanted a spirituality without a religion. People like Emerson and Thoreau and the Alcotts and Nathaniel Hawthorne, they wanted to be spiritual but not religious. But to their credit, they agreed that we all thirst for, hunger for unity and truth, goodness and beauty. Unity is the thirst for intimate love. Yes, Jesus loves me, he sings in that song. I felt his love for me. How could I not as an asthmatic child in the arms of a loving mother? And I felt the bond between my parents, two more different people you couldn't imagine, a Sicilian Catholic from Brooklyn, an evangelical German, English, anti-Catholic from the Bronx, my mother could go to any church she wanted to, including Hebrew school. Many of her friends were Jewish, except the church she was taught to believe was not even Christian, but even a cult. Have you heard that one? Okay. And yet they loved Jesus. And I felt that intimacy with Jesus from my earliest memories, along with Tennessee Waltz by Patti Page and Some Enchanted Evening by Ezio Pinza. I think it's the first song I can remember. Oh, yes, I felt the love of Jesus in the loving arm, in the loving embrace of a loving mother with a beautiful song, Yes, Jesus Loves Me. Truth, I call that endless love. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I never go any place without my two-pocket Bibles. You want to see them? I didn't get them from Catholics. I got them from the Gideon Society. English and Espanol. I do have my preaching in Spanish. Even in my Guayabera, I will take 
my Gideon New Testament and Psalms, and my Gideon Nuevo Testamento y Salmos. And don't say, well, I have that in my cell phone. No fair. Because oftentimes we spend much more time on this with Facebook and emails and Twitter than this. Am I exaggerating? The Bible tells me so. These words will pass. Thank God. But these words will not pass. Amen? The words of eternal life. Goodness, sacrificial love. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. He prays, Father, may they be one as you and I are one. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Is that why so many people join us Catholics? Because they want something that's not politically correct, but they want the truth. Amen? And isn't that why they join us because of our saints? Because they see people who have sacrificed themselves to be like Christ, the good shepherd. And I had two parents who were good shepherds to me, giving, getting up in the middle of the night. My dad ran two stores, child of the Depression, because he didn't want us to suffer. And so I think that's why he died of an early age, at the age of 57. Brothers, don't overdo it. I know we're very busy, but our people need us. Take some time, as Father Dave was saying, to take some time to rest and let the Holy Spirit move you to throw yourselves in the arms of Jesus Christ and to fall in love with him again and again. Sacrificial love. Don't the saints do that? Isaac Kecker, the holy card that I hope you all have, the man who became a Catholic and who wanted to turn the whole country on to the Catholic spirit, was a man who sacrificed a great deal. Years and years of chronic leukemia. And nevertheless, he was able to be a paritas at the First Vatican Council one of the consultants at the Baltimore Catechism Plenary Council of Baltimore and founder of the first male religious order in the United States, the Paulist Fathers. Not bad for a fellow with chronic leukemia. Sacrifice. But don't we all? I, my heart goes out to these young people who get married, who are pregnant, who want to have large families and form a domestic church. That certainly is not politically correct. But let me tell you, those are the saints of our day. The saints are not the preachers. The saints are the people who come to hear you preach. Amen. And finally, beauty. What a beautiful song, Yes, Jesus Loves Me. My mom was a beautiful woman. You should have seen her in her Marines uniform. Thank God she was married. Beautiful song, beautiful lyrics, and a beautiful religion. Christ is the image of the invisible God. But there is something he wanted to give us, to show us what St. Augustine would call a beauty, so ancient and yet so new. I said God the Father is the composer. I said God the Son, Jesus, is the vocalist. I said the Holy Spirit is the melody, God the Holy Spirit. The lyrics are the word of God. But I left out a dancer. You need a dancer, don't you? I think Jennifer Lopez is retiring from Dancing with the Stars, or American Idol, I can't remember, but a great dancer. We had Fred Astaire. George Balanchine said the greatest dancer of the 20th century. Who's the dancer of this video called The Trinity? It is Mary. I'm convinced she danced as she sang, My heart proclaims the greatness of the Lord. The Magnificat is a canticle which meant it's sung. And you know in the Jewish culture, dance is so very central and fundamental. I think that's why Mary asked for more wine at Cana, because the DJ was complaining that nobody was on the dance floor dancing to the electric slide, the Cupid shuffle, the Macarena, or the alley cat. Have I covered all generations? The twist, you're even before I am. No, not really. In fact, we sang the twist the other night at a 50th wedding anniversary, combining La Bamba with twist and shout. 
Mary. I didn't have much of a Marian devotion until I met a group of women religious in the seminary, the Oblatas de Jesus Sacerdote. They prayed and sacrificed for us seminarians and priests. They asked me to teach them the guitar. Well, I happened to play the guitar because I wanted to be another Elvis. And I wound up in Memphis for 16 years. I spoke Spanish because they told me it was easier than French. Now I use it every single day. The Holy Spirit. So I taught them the guitar, and I fell in love with their culture, with the way they brought Jesus to me. They brought Jesus to me through Mary because I could experience a Catholic Jesus, a Jesus that I could embrace, a Jesus who was wrapped in swaddling clothes. You know, Christmas was originally outlawed in the United States because people thought it was too Catholic. It is. We believe in a bambino, Jesu. A Jesus who was born, a Jesus who walks, a Jesus who weeps, a Jesus who dances, a Jesus who even dies. Amen? Isn't that the Catholic Jesus? Why don't we proclaim it? And we call people to it. And those nuns called me to Jesus. Two of them's names were Guad Guadalupe. I never heard of Guadalupe in my life. What a strange name. All my friends were Jewish when I was growing up, Long Island, New York. My prom date was Jewish. All my closest friends were Jewish. Who's Guadalupe? So I decided to go to Mexico to check out Our Lady of Guadalupe. I fell in love with La Morenita. I could see where all of this came from. Because isn't that the Catholic Jesus? Isn't Mary the one who gives Jesus the flesh? Isn't that the Christ we believe in? The Word become flesh? And how could you, the Word become flesh if there's no woman to give him flesh. And so I fell in love with La Morenita because she brought Jesus to the new world. Amen. I wish she could run for president. I'd vote for her tomorrow. Pro-life, pro-family, pro-immigrant, right? Pro-poor. I think Pope Francis someday will go to Our Lady of Guadalupe Shrine. Amen. Because they have so much in common. Anyway, I bought an image of a Lady of Guadalupe from my mother. How can you reject a gift from a son who's going into the seminary? And she thought I'd be away for seven years. She wept when I left. So did my dad. But I bought them a Lady of Guadalupe. And that image stayed in our home for 15 years. And on my eighth year of priesthood, on a beautiful Easter, I received my mother into the Catholic Church. <laughs> I said, Mom, I practically fainted when she told me. You, you're 64 years old. I almost said, you're not going to get married again, right? My dad had already died. I want to be a Catholic. She sa I said, why? How? And she says, well, this old priest said, Vivian, you've been a Catholic all your life without knowing it. We would invite everybody into our house to watch the first television set. Uncle Milty, remember Uncle Milty and then Uncle Fulty, Fulton Sheen? I mean, we had Jehovah's Witnesses, we had Jewish people, we had Protestants, we had Catholics, we had you name it in our little house. Isn't that what a Catholic is, amen? To welcome everybody? Isn't that what Pope Francis did? Two weeks ago? Isn't that what Pentecost is all about? Isn't that what the Holy Spirit does? Amen? You know what I had the congregation do on Pentecost Sunday? Sing Manionitas. Sing happy birthday to the Catholic Church. Isn't that when we were born? With tongues of fire? With every language of the world coming together in unity? But I want to become a Catholic, she said, because... Boy, you sounded so enthusiastic at your Italian grandmother's funeral. You sounded like you really liked your religion. You know what I said at my grandmother's funeral? Thanks be to God, Grandma. You taught me how to dance. You gave me pizza. You taught me the importance of family. But you passed on the Catholic faith. And we belong to the world's greatest rainbow co throne coalition, don't we? 
We are e pluribus unum. Precisely because it was the Holy Spirit that brought Christ into the world in the body of Christ called the church. Christ in my heart, Christ in your heart, making of our hearts one heart. And it ends with that dancer called Mary. As Pope Francis says, Mary, mother of evangelization, Jesus' gift to his people. With the Holy Spirit, Mary is always present in the midst of the people. She joined the disciples in praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit and thus made possible the missionary outburst which took place at Pentecost. She is the mother of the church which evangelized. And without her, we could never truly understand the spirit of the new evangelization. And what is the spirit of the new evangelization? Yes. 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 Jesus loves me. Amen.